Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. It's so good to see you all here. Thank you so much for signing up for this webinar by the Chinese American Librarians Association and Reforma. And so we are really delighted to have so many of you here interested in learning more about this specific topic. My name is Ray Pan. I am the immediate past president of the Chinese American Librarians Association, <laughs> also known as Kala and Kala, uh, for those who are not familiar, it's a nonprofit library association, volunteer led for the past 50 years, has focused on supporting Chinese and Chinese American librarians and library workers and the diaspora. And we have many, many um, opportunities uh, in terms of scholarships and support. If you are interested in joining and learning more about Kala, we are an affiliate of the American Library Association and so forth. So I'm gonna drop here in the link. If you wanna learn more about us and our free um, activities that we have uh, like this one today. And so we're really delighted to have you all here with us. And with that, I wanted to pass it over to uh, Reforma President, David Lopez. David. Hola, buenos dias, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is David Lopez. I'm the president of Reforma the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinos in the Spanish Speaking. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to thank the Chinese American Librarians Association for the invitation to partner on today's webinar. It is through our continued partnership with Kala and other members of the National Associations of Librarians of Color that we can forge through challenges on the path of progress and innovation in the world of libraries. Since 1971, Reforma has actively sought to promote the development of library connections, uh, collections to include Spanish language and Latino, Latinx, Latine oriented materials, services and programs, as well as the recruitment of more bilingual and bicultural library professionals. As an organization, Reforma has established a national and international network for information and support to individuals who share these goals. The richness found in organizations like Reforma and Cala is that we have varied lived experiences and we are informed by the beauty of our intersections. As library professionals doing work toward the advancement of the field and human services, we call on our passion and strive to bridge the gaps across generations and communities. I want to thank Gala once again for including Reforma in this very important conversation that sheds light on a unique history that informs the work many of us do today and amplifies underheard narratives. For more information on Reforma, please visit reforma.org and I'll drop it also in the chat. Muchísimas gracias and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you, David. I also wanted to give a shout out that uh, today, I believe, is the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month. So uh, uh, congrats and kudos if you're celebrating. Uh, that's great that we could come together, as David mentioned. And I also want to um, extend my thanks to the Reforma International Relations Committee, chaired by Loida garcia Febo and Elizabeth Garcia, um, who are here, I think. So uh, thank you for um, uh, working with me on this. And so now we have this webinar here. And I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker for today is uh, Laura de Moya Guerrera, is a history PhD student at Rutgers, the State University of New York, and she received an MA in history and BA in political science from the Universidad del Norte in Colombia. Her research and topics interests cover migration and diasporas in Colombia in the 20th century. Her first project studied the Arab migration to Barranquilla. I'm sorry, it must be mis I might be mispronouncing them. Um, in the first half of the last century. Her current research explores the Chinese diaspora in Colombia and beginning with the separation of Panama in 1903 and culminating in Colombia's recognition of the one child policy in 1980. Laura's project asked for the arrival of Chinese immigrants, the establishments of aid societies, the businesses they undertook and their relationship with the host society. Now I'll pass it over to Laura. Thank you so much, Laura. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Kala uh, and Reforma, for organizing this webinar and for having me for today. I'm so excited and feel so honored um, to share with all of you um, my uh, my work and my journey as a historian working with archive 
and collections about um, Chinese diaspora, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. And thank you to all of you, uh, the attendees that have me join, take the time to listen for what I prepare for today. So I'm going to share my screen. One sec, please. Can you see my screen now? Okay, I see. Okay, so what I have prepared for today, it's going to be um, the Chinese experience in Latin America, history, archive, and collection. So I will be talking about the Chinese migration to the region. And at the same time, I'm going to be highlighting some archive and collections that if you are interested in this topic, if you want to learn more about it, read, or you know someone who works the topics, you can uh, take a look at these collections and get more into the topic. So let's dive in. So I want to start with the 19th century. Um, the 19th century for um, Latin America and the Caribbean was a, a century of many changes, right? In the beginning of the 19th century, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the former colonies achieved independence from the uh, empires. For example, most of the um, Spanish, former Spanish colonies uh, formed a new independent um, countries, new nations. So they were trying to figure it out what a nation it was what it means to be ruled by their own, right? Completely separate in this case from Spain. But at the same time, in the mid 19th century and very late in that century, we also have colonies. Like for example, from the um, Spanish empire, we had uh, Puerto Rico and Cuba, which um, in case of Cuba, uh, got the independence very late, almost 20, almost early 20th century, right? And also we have, especially in the Caribbean area, uh, uh, still British colony, Dutch colony, and French colony very uh, late in the um, 20th century. So the 19th century for the region, for Latin America and the Caribbean, it will be a century of um, like contradictions, kind of. New republics and old colonies at the same time in the same um, geographically region, right? This is important uh, for the Chinese um, migration because the abolition in the new um, republics and new countries uh, were abolished, right? Um, the slave trade was um, canceled, prohibited, banned. Uh, in the new countries. But in Cuba, for example, that was a reminder colony for almost all 19th century, the uh, slavery was still legal and it was happening at the time at the island. So uh, the slave trade was banned, which means like the Cuban owners and Cuban planters couldn't uh, import um, in black African slaves to the plantations, right? So they have a problem because um, at, the, at that time, uh, the, Cuba, the Cuba was the number one sugar producer of the entire world, was the number one supply of the sugar. But they didn't have um, labor to do that, enslaved labor to do that. So they start to think in a way how we can get more hands to work, right? And that's where the um, Chinese enter to the uh, Latin American and Caribbean scenario, right? They start to import, bring uh, Chinese indirect laborers into the island, may, mostly Cuba, but also uh, the British, uh, Dutch, and French. Indies also uh, uh, adopt this um, way of indirect indirect um, labor, and they start to bring by the mid nineteenth century. Uh, Chinese uh, Chinese to the region, right? So these people uh, worked in cane fields, sugar ingenios, in different mines. They built railroads and also did domestic work, right? As you can see um, in the PowerPoint, Cuba uh, was um, the colony which imported more um, Chinese numerically 
125,000 uh, Chinese arrived approximately. And then was Peru, that it was not a colony, it was an independent country, but it adopt, but Peru adopted this um this um uh way of labor too. And of course, um the other um remaining colonies as British, Dutch, and French in the Caribbean, right? So by the mid-19th century, we have independence, independence country, we have colony, we have abolished, most of the countries have abolished slavery, but not in Cuba, and we have intertour labor, and at the same time, we have slavery happening in Cuba at the same time, right? So how these people came, right? How was the process, how they landed in, in, in these places? What you are seeing, the document that you are seeing uh, on the PowerPoint is an actual contract between a Cuban uh, owner plantation and a, a Chinese broker, right? Uh, it basically the contract for these inter two workers, or they also at the time were called coolie, uh, it was a six to eight years contract uh, of servitude that there was they didn't use the um words uh slavery but they used the word servitude right uh it's supposed like the patron the master will provide um the inter two worker it will provide clothes a wage a food a shelter um some days off right so there was legally it was a difference between being a slave right that being an inter to work. However, in the practice, historians have uh, noticed and have found that the Chinese inter to workers in Cuba, Peru, and all of these islands suffered mistreatment, punishment, uh, harassment, uh, and all of kind of uh, physical abuse from the uh, plantation's owner, right? In fact, these inter two workers labored at in the same cane fields uh, side by side, African enslaved uh, woman, woman and men, right? So in the practice, it was like they were they were legally free, but in 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 everyday situations, they were treated like slave, right? So this was uh, the big. Um, start of Chinese migration to the region, even it was called inter to inter Chinese inter to workers or the uh coolie or the Chinese coolie. We also use it that term. I have to mention too that as a British the British colony also uh get uh, Indian Indian coolies from I mean at the same time the Caribbean the, the Caribbean possession of British Empire and India at that time was also a colony. So the British Empire arranged everything to pass Indian um Indian uh India in the two workers to the uh to the Caribbean to the British Caribbean. So it was the Chinese but uh and the uh Indian too, right? So that was like the scenario in the mid of 19th century. So this situation has created a huge debate in among historians in the scholarship from the 1970s and still going, I think. Um, historian has debated if this indirect worker was a fancy name for a new slavery, right, for example. You can see here, it's a, actually a Chinese indirect worker in a Wamo mine in Peru. You can see he uh in working and he's in his um uncles he has iron, right? To stop that he will run away. Uh very similar what was um to use what they used to use uh for African enslaved people, right? So this picture has been there for a while and caused, of course, shock and impression to the people. And it has served uh, for historians to uh, that say, like, in their two worker wars, actually, slavery with other, uh, with other name. One of these people that first say, 
okay, this was happening something here. It was Franklin Knight, which I quote here. He says, Chinese slavery in Cuba in the 19th century was slavery in every social aspect expect, except the name, right? End of the quote. So basically he's saying they were treated like a, they were legally free because they had a contract, right? They were supposed to work for eight, six to eight years. They will then come back to China, but many of these people in these six, eight years contract were mistreated, was, uh, uh, were um, punished by the master. So they were legally free, but they were not in daily, lay, daily, day, daily um, situations. They were not, they were treated like a slave. The only difference some scholars argue is the skin color. They were not black, they were other, but they were treated like a slave. Other scholars say, uh, it was kind of semi-slavery because it was a temporary um, uh, situation or status, but because eventually if they pay for the master, if they run away, they will end this semi-slavery. For me, I am not a specialist or not a specialized in 19th century. Uh, in 19th century, I have 20th century. 20th century historian, but for me, uh, the real question is not if they were freed or not. For me, it's what we can learn about these daily life interactions between Black enslaved, Black African slave people and Chinese in their two work. What was happening there, right? It's for me, it's the real question. If we agree, they, they work in the same fields, they work as a domestic workers sometimes. What was happening? What, how was that interaction between these two group of people? And one of the things that I have found, which is, I think it's uh, very important and have not been studied so much is the Chinese participation in the Cuban wars of independence. And I think this is a meeting point where we can find the Chinese um, in the two workers and also the black um, African slave people of Cuba, right? As I said before, Cuba remained a Spanish colony for almost all 19th century. Cuba uh, got the independence in 1898, almost 20th century, right? So in the meantime, the Revolutionary Army fight, fought against Spain many times, many different wars. La Guerra Pequeña, uh, la, um, the Ten Years War, right? And, this is, and Cuban scholars have found that the Chinese participate. At the same time, they did alliance with Black African slave people to fight for Cuba, right? So the Cuban War of Independence allowed me to see and the scholars that there were cross racial alliance between these people. They just not share um, the physical labor in the cane fields. They also share uh, in the battlefield, actually. So there's a, a very famous quote by now, which says there was no a Chinese Cuban deserter. There was no a Chinese Cuban traitor, right? Which is basically is trying to remember, trying to uh uh yeah, to remember that the Chinese in their two workers fought, fought for for um Cuba independence uh alongside the whites and on, alongside uh the revolutionary army and all alongside also with the black African uh enslaved people at that time. So I think that's important to highlight. And I see uh, instead of being the debate if they were free or not, semi-slavery or not, I think this is a more, I will say, useful to, useful uh, insight to analyze uh, these two uh, group of people, I will say. What you see in the image is a El Monumento al Soldado Chino, the Chinese soldier monument in the Havana. I have to highlight here the fantastic work of my colleague, Janet Jimenez. She has been um, working about the Chinese diaspora in the island for a while. And she has a fantastic job about the um, 
meaning of this monument, right? What its implication it has when it was built and what it represents and what is important to remember the Chinese um, participation in this Cuban War of Independence and how integrate the Chinese uh, allowed us to uh, break with this tradition that Cuban society, and I will say extend to Latin America, it was just black and white, right? The Chinese uh, came to the island and kind of disrupt this uh, binary, color binary that were in the Iceland, but I will say also in Latin America too. So uh, that was the beginning of the Chinese experience in Latin America. We had, I mean, like Latin America, especially um, what is now Mexico, had a kind of Chinese migrants and presence very early with the Galeon de San Jose and things like that, but it was very specific and it was very early in the colony. So I'm focusing in 19th and 20th century uh, for today. And I want to include also archive collections that you can visit um, and maybe take a look if you are interested in this topic. I have found uh, the Biblioteca Nacional de Cuba, Jose Martí has a fantastic collection called Fototeca, uh, uh, where you can see um, documents, especially photographs. I am, in my work, I try to uh, push myself in a good way to uh, all, always include um, visual sources, not, not like an attachment, not like, like really um, work with visual sources. As a historian, we are not training, we are not training to read uh, iconography, to read visual sources. So I, I always to include that in my work. So that was, I put there. And um, also in the United States, you have University of Maryland, the collection of Spanish language and manuscript, which is enormous. It goes from the 1500 to almost 19th century. And they have their some translation to these Chinese contract, uh, Chinese contract. Um, and you also have, if you are interested, to the University of Florida special and um, area studies collections. They have fifty two Chinese indentured workers contract. All of them from uh, Chinese that arrived in in Cuba in the nineteenth century. It, they have some samples that you can uh, search online, but most of the, I mean, like the materials are available to be consulted uh, in person in Florida. But I will, I will encourage you to visit um, their website to be in contact because it's a, if you are interested in this topic, uh, if you are a Cuban historian or a Chinese um, diaspora historian, this will be a very useful um, resource to look at uh, and to find. Uh, I found it very useful, uh, especially University of Florida collection. It's it's very, um, uh, has a lot of potential. So I want to end the 19th century, um, the 19th century with the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? The um, Today's talk and webinar is based mostly in Latin America. So why I include this Chinese Exclusion Act from the United States, right? Because it was uh, before and after in the whole hemisphere uh, with this um, with this uh, act in 8082, right? So it prohib basically what this um, document did was prohibit all immigration of the Chinese labor to the United States at least from ten for ten years, right? It was, at the same time, the first U.S. law to prohibit the entrance of a specific national group. Not before in the history of U.S., uh, the government has prohibited and banned the entrance of one group of people based on nationality, right? So basically, they were saying if you were a Chinese and you were a Chinese label, you cannot enter to the United States, no matter what. There were some ex exemptions, um, like merchants, teachers, diplomats, students were allowed to be in the entrance and be in the United States, but you have to prove that you were um, 
these um you, you that you can fit in these categories and for our topic of today the most important thing of the chinese exclusion act in the united states is that it had a huge impact across all of the uh latin america and the caribbean after the issue of this act in 8082 many um independent countries that just achieve that they were uh, celebrating could be um, one centenary of independence in the first years of the um, 20th century. They will start issue law that prohibit the entrance of the uh, Chinese um, migrations. In the case of Colombia, which is my um, my main area of study, it does in 8082, but kind of very early, just five years after the United States did. And they did mainly because at that time, Panama was still part of Colombia and Colombia government was trying to build the Panama Canal, which did they not. Uh, so for that, they imported uh, Chinese workers, in Chinese industry workers to uh, work in this, um, in this huge um, building, right? So that part of Colombia, now Panama, was full of Chinese, says one source, right? So people start to complain. Uh, people start to complain. Uh, so the government say like, okay, no more Chinese in Colombia in from 8087, 80, 80, sorry. So that's Colombia, then Costa Rica, and then Panama when get independence, and Panama twice, as you can see there, and then other part of, um, of uh, other countries of Latin America independent, but also colonies like Jamaica was a colony by 1940, a British colony, and still was issued uh, laws against the Chinese migration. So that, that's why the Chinese Exclusion Act, even if it just encompassed um, geographically the United States, it impact, uh, impacted all the hemispheres, all the America were impacted by this uh, Exclusion Act. So with that exclusion, we enter to the 20th century, right? So the in the 20th century, um, the inner to worker um, weight of war was banned and abolished. Uh, the Ch China uh, did not allow that anymore. So the new migrants that were arriving were kind of, if we want to use that term, completely free, right? Were free migrants. They were not the pen of a patrono. They don't. They did not have a master. That was not a 20th century thing anymore for the Chinese in Latin America and the Caribbean, right? So that helped also to the Chinese uh, settle in new countries, like countries that they were not kind of uh, searching for labor, specifically like what the case in the 19th century for Peru and Cuba, but all other countries, right? Like Colombia, Venezuela, um, Ecuador too. They arrived also to Argentina. So they start in the 20th century the diaspora in Latin America, it's bigger. They start to fill in other countries. They, they start to settle in other, um, in other places, right? And they were not, um, and they were not, of course, um, um, plantations workers anymore, right? Most of them uh, opening different kind of, um, they they develop different kind of economic activities, like they do laundries, vegetable cultivation, grocery stores, commerce, and of course restaurants. So they were economically diverse, to put it that way. So you are you, what you can see here is a uh, a pamphlet uh, like an advertising from different Chinese restaurants in Lima, right? In Lima, um, Havana has the had the two most dynamic, uh, big Chinatowns in Latin America. So uh, you you see here like. Advertisers for a Chinese different Chinese restaurants um, in Lima that now are called called Chifa, and the Chinese food is called Chaofa. So, 
the the um the Chinese um had a huge impact in the um in especially in Lima society, right? However, we end however we enter a new century, right? And the inter to work in their two world was bad and they were free migrants if we, if we want to label that way. The discrimination against Chinese migrants was still happening, right? And that's where I uh, want to highlight the Torreon mass massacre or Massacre de Torreon in north Northwest Mexico. Um, between May 13 and 15, 1911, the Mexican revolutionary troops massacred and killed around 300 Chinese in the city of Torreón, in the estado de Coahuila, right? Uh, this is one of the most violence, physical violence, um, uh, evidence of Chinese, uh, against the Chinese community in Latin America. It's very early in the 20th century. And it still reminds, I will say, even though there's a scholars that have been working around the topic, I think it need to, it deserves more attention, right? It, it, it is a dark um, event of the Mexican Revolution, de la, de la Revolución Mexicana, the Mexican Revolution, that need to be studied, right? What did it mean that the revolutionary troops of Madero massacred these people, right? Um, of course, the Chinese properties like the bank, the Club Chino, the laundry restaurants were destroyed. And they were expelled uh, also from uh, Sonora, another um, Mexican state too. You can see here like on a pamphlet, uh, they, they were anti-Chinese committees in all over, I will say Mexico and also Latin America. I have found in Colombia too, very early in the 20th century. So this pamphlet is after um, the massacre but it says, uh, basically it's saying like, we remember that we were meet, we were having a meeting this Friday. Uh, so please join us to discuss how, what we're gonna do about the Chinese. And it says, por la, por la patria y por la raza, uh, fight against the Chinese is fine for our kids or our children. So it's very dark. Um, and it's, every time I read it, it's quite of shocking, honestly. Uh, so yeah, um, I bring this to you to call the attention that even they were not in their two waters anymore, the discrimination and racism against the Chinese community, not just in Mexico, and it, it was not just massacres. This is like the iceberg, the point of the iceberg, right? Uh, they were discriminated in all of Latin American countries, right? So I want to highlight that. And also I want to highlight that on May 2021, 2021, 110 years after this massacre, this dark episode, Andres Lopez Obrador, the former, um, at that time, Mexican pre president, uh, did a public apology uh, to the Chinese community of Torreón, the Chinese community of Mexico, and he say, as a Mexican president, we're sorry about that. We will not happen that it happened again, right? So he was trying to do that. And also I want to share with you uh, kind of the, the Torreón mas massacre. It's like the most visible episode of anti-Chinese um, sentiment of moving in Latin America, I will say, but it was not the only one, of course. And I'm here you bringing you um, a part of a note, a press note that I found in a Colombian newspaper called El Tiempo in 1922, which is basically uh, recounted that some dates before, a ship with Chinese arrived to Barranquilla, Colombia, and they have they, they were calling to the government to do something about these people, right? Because they were arriving. So many people was arriving. So they say these ungrateful visitors do not contribute. They do not 
good work, they live violating the hygiene and hoarding money. And the best thing is that they leave behind defects that infect their race, right? So this was, this was happening in Colombia, a country that is not widely recognized uh, for being uh, a migrant country and also for not having a huge and large Chinese community, right? Compared to other countries in Latin America, Colombia never did never receive a huge Chinese a huge Chinese um, migrants, right? But they arrived. Even they were small in numerically, they were victims of this kind of um, uh, discrimination, I will say. On the other hand, you have um, a cartoon from a Lima newspaper or publication, which is uh, happening in 1909. Um, what, what happened was like the, the um, local government of Lima, the capital of Peru, and one of the most uh, largest Chinatowns in, in Latin America, they uh, expelled the Chinese from uh, their own houses, from their own, um, business, they send to fire and they say, you have to leave, you have to move, you cannot be here, right? That was, that was uh, El Callejón or Calle Capón uh, episode, right? So what is shocking about the, this illustration is like, you can see here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but it's, uh, this is like the, the political authority here. They are destroying, physically destroying their possessions. And you can see the Chinese like living with luggage and their things. And there is a rat too, right? So the illustrator represent the Chinese people of Lima, Peru as a rat, right? So this is another way of discrimination, right? It was another way. It was not just that actual happened, like they were expelled from their homes in Calle Capón, but the way also that the people or the, the um, illustrator um, portrayed them, right? Like like uh, compared them to a rat, like people that were no hygiene, that people that were transmitted um, illness and things like that. So. I want to use this um, PowerPoint and this slide specifically to show you that no matter it was a huge community like in Lima, Peru, or it was a small community like in Barranquilla, Colombia, the discrimination was, was happening everywhere in Latin America against the Chinese community. And also we had especially in the case in Mexico, there was a book called El Ejemplo de Sonora, which was very racist and derogatory book about the Chinese. And it implied that if you as a Mexican woman marriage of a child with a Chinese, um, with a Chinese man, your um, offspring will be uh, a disaster. Your, your offspring will be uh, nothing good to put in that way. So this book, um, most of these discrimination were based on eugenic theories that basically state like some races were best than others. So in order to get in better our race, in this case, Mexican race, but it applies to all of Latin America, we have to prevent to mix with these low races, right? Uh, so the Chinese were considered low races, a low race um, in Mexico by uh, 1930s. So if you will, if you as a, as a um, local woman, a, a Mexican woman will marry this, these people, your offspring will suffer, which is kind of more, uh, proof in this um, illustration. This is one, the, the book is have a bunch of um, illustrations that are similar to this. Uh, so it says it's the honeymoon or la noche de bodas, right? Where the woman is like kind of sexy and she's beautiful because she's happy, she's getting married. Uh, and the other says like five years later, cinco años después, and you see she looks like an zombie kind of, she has three child, 
and her husband is like not paying attention. He's away. So it was trying kind of an advertising, like a, a warning that you should not walk, not should not um, marry a Chinese um, a Chinese um, man, right? So the discrimination was all over. I mean, like everywhere. It took different forms. It was happening in small communities, large communities. It was happening everywhere, right? So I want to recommend some archive collections. Uh, I also, I always recommend that you visit, if you are working in specific geographically, you will, you visit um, El Archivo General, in this case, Archivo General de Mexico, <clears throat> in my case, El Archivo General de Colombia, which is located in Bogota. Uh, and also, uh, there are some universities in Latin America that have private collections and libraries, like, for example, the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, which is located in Lima, have acquired, uh, which is private, it's not a public university, but they, but they have open access. Um, they have acquired a bunch of, uh, especially photos and documents from Chinese in Peru in 19th, 20th century. It's, so if you are interested, you can take a look of that. Uh, so yeah. And, and I want to also highlight a little bit my own research because as I say, I work at the Chinese in Colombia, 20th century mostly. And I think uh, every time I say it aloud, like, hey, I study on my research, my doctoral project is about the Chinese in Colombia. People is like, oh, there are Chinese in Colombia. And I say like, yeah, they have been there for more than 100 years. <laughs> so uh, it's a very fascinating um, project that I embark on. Um, I focus on, if we want to, uh, say it like free migrants, people that came, they were not under any kind of contract. They arrived, I have found that they have connection in San Francisco, California. They also were arriving from Jamaica, Trinidad, Panama. So the, Colombia was never uh, their first option to stay, actually. What my guess is that they were uh, based in other places and then Someone tell that there was an opportunity in Colombia or some relative move to Colombia, so they start to arrive. In, in addition to that, Colombia is the only South America country with um, water in both Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. So that gives the Chinese community or the Chinese migrant the opportunity to arrive and settle in both. In the Pacific, they settle like, for example, Buenaventura, Cali, and in the coast or, or the Caribbean, they settled mainly in Barranquilla, but also Cartagena de India, Santa Marta. Um, and in advance in the 20th century, they, sent, they, they settled all over um, Colombia. Uh, so basically, um, the um, note that I have here is, uh, she's describing the, the ship where he was, she's recounting her grandfather, um, uh, journey. The ship where he was sailing stopped in Cuba, where there was a Chinese community, but he didn't know want to stay there. He also stopped in Panama, but did not want to stay there either, right? So two, two stopped before I arrived to Colombia. Buenaventura, Colombia, which was a port, is a port, was the last destination of that ship, and there he landed, right? So these uh Chinese descendant or Chinese Colombian descendant, it's uh, narrates to be um, the journey of her grandfather and how he arrived to the country. And on the right, you have um, one of the few printer color advertisements uh, that I have found in the archive in Colombia, which is uh, advertised uh, La Nueva China, which is like an uh, uh, commerce, um, a commerce store or company that import any kind of textiles. Um, and it was uh, located in Barranquilla, which hosted the um, largest dynamic, and I would say most important Chinese community in whole Colombia. It's, it's from 1928. And I want to highlight also like, for me, working with a community that is not too big, 
numerically has been a challenge. The archive has been a challenge. So I have relied mostly in local archive, right? Like Archivo Histórico del Atlántico. So please, if you are looking at uh, some communities that are not large enough maybe to be housed in a uh, in Archivo General or something like that, please do not discard uh, the local archive because I think they, they have potential. I have found census, I have found notarial records, I have found um, um, uh, any testament wills about the Chinese in Colombia in the local archive in the city that I come from, which is Barranquilla, right? So that's another uh, recommendation I can give you. Like always um, look for the small archive. They have, they are interesting um, places to to be and to, to take account. And also I want to part, as a part of my um, project, I have found that particularly the Chinese community in Colombia where involved a lot with um, carnival and festivities. Uh, I know that they did two in Mexico and, and the carnival of Trinidad, but I have found that particularly the, the Barranquilla carnival is especially important for uh, the country. So they involve, they integrate. So nevertheless, they were discriminated uh, before they arrived to the country, in this case, Colombia, but it applies to Latin America in general. They, they did effort to integrate to the whole society, to mix with the culture, to learn about traditions. And I think the carnival, uh, the carnival represents that, right? So they, they were doing uh, the best that they can to integrate with the whole uh, community and the whole society uh, traditions. And it was happening in all other places, not just with carnival, but with food, with, um, ceremonies and things like that. So I want to share with you some final thoughts. Um, the Chinese community in Latin America have faced legal, legal and social discriminations as we have seen violent, physical violence and different kind of uh, discrimination. Despite that, they have built a community, venture into different business, different um, economic activities, and they have integrating into whole societies, right? So the picture that you have on the last picture, I think, is the entrance of the um, China, the Chinatown in Havana, Cuba, which is what was at the time after San Francisco, the most important, huge and dynamic Chinatown in all other, in all um, hemisphere. So I want to end with that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Please everyone join me in thanking Laura for that wonderful presentation, very thoughtful, put together, and really draws on a lot of the parallels that we're seeing um, today and with the uh, violence in, in America, especially towards the anti-Asian sentiment um, with COVID, unfortunately, and so forth. And I know there's been a lot of questions coming in. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in a chat box and I will uh, read them to you. And um, there's a couple of them I'm going to do right here in the chat box. And then we're going to go into the advanced questions that people had sent ahead of time. So there's one from Elizabeth Garcia. Hello, Laura. Did you have to get advanced permission to view documents in Biblioteca de Cuba? Yes. Yes. Um, you have to kind of write like a letter trying to explain why you want to visit, what is your project about it. Um, ask and wait for a couple of days. In the business scenario, it could take months <laughs> uh, if they approve your request. But yes, you have to email them or write a letter to review the documentation. Yes, you have to. Thank you for that. I thought it was really interesting, Laura, how you shared um, the different types of um, archives um, and from national level to local, right? So um, I, I thought that was really helpful, especially for researchers and for all of us, right? Um, librarian suits really think about the local voices that are often not in the official or national count sometimes. And um, here's one from Antonio. How did the Manila, Acapulco, Galleon, and other Trans-Pacific trade contribute to Chinese influence in Latin America? 
Yeah, as I say, I focus on 19th, 20th century migration. So Galeon de San Jose, it's more like 17th, uh, 16th century colonial Latin America. I'm not an expert too, but what I know is uh, they arrive uh, and with these Chinese that arrived in Galeon de San Jose, Trans Pacific, um, Trans Pacific Via, they were bringing, for example, some um, merchandise. They were bringing some uh, uh, clothes and things like people at that time were far. I mean, like Mex now Mexicans and at that time Criollos uh, were were from fascinating. So they were trying to uh, initiate. Um, Trades with China, especially for por 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 porcelana, porcelain, um, things like that, right? So they were trying to do that. Um, there's a book I can recommend. It's from Tatiana. Oh my God, Tatiana uh, Flores, I think. Uh, it's called Indios Chinos. I say is in English, an uh, English book. You can look at it, and she has a uh, fantastic uh, research about this early presence of Chinese in um, Latin America, especially Mexico. Thanks, Laura. You could send that title to me later. If... Yeah, I I will remember exactly <laughs> the title. <laughs> yeah. So here's another question. Um, this one's in Spanish, so I'm going to read this in English. Hello, Laura. Okay. Do you know why the Chinese specialized in the laundry business? If that's... Why did the, the Chinese um, specialized in laundry business? That's if I read the... Correct, my translation is correct. That's fine, that's fine. Why did they did specialize in that? I will I will talk up for the Chinese in Colombia and what have they shared with me and what I have found in the archive. There's multiple reasons why they did that. I would say in Colombia, I don't know in other countries, but I will say kind of similar. First, it was a very physical labor. It, I will say easy in this in the sense that it was not so uh demanding. I mean, like you can do it manually before washing machine, you can do it manually. You don't have to have a large capital to invest, right? You just need your hands probably to wash it. Uh so you can do it in your backyard, you can do it in your home. It at the, at that time you don't need it like a huge space. To, to do that activity. And also for what I have, the interviews I had done, they told me like they, um, their um, ancestors did that because it was kind of, uh, it was a service that they found that it can uh, contribute, contribute to their um, link with the, whole, with the whole society, right? You are taking, in care of my clothes. You are kind of, you are uh, linked to me. It was a, a way to link with the whole society. It was a service that everybody needs, or mo all the people ca that can afford, that could afford needed. So it was a way, it was easy to do. I, I, don't, I don't like to say easy, but it was kind of not difficult to do. It did not require a lot of capital. I mean, cash or money to put it that work. You don't need to know the language, for example. I mean, like, it's just like this, this is, this, this shirt, it is dirty. I need to for, I don't know, fright or whatever, right? So it was kind of, and, and, and that's interesting because it was the kind of the first business that they get into, right? When they improve their language or their um offspring now, now born in this, uh, in Latin America, Growing up, learning Spanish and speaking Spanish, they open other um or their venture in other economic activities that require more language um uh proficiency, like for example, grocery stores, right? Uh, or for example, um a restaurant, right? You have to memorize a menu, kind of. You have to have a better um uh uh. You have to understand better the language, I will say, but not in a in a laundry mat. So that one, that's Colombia. I don't know the other country, but that's what I, they have shared in Colombia. I would say similar. Yeah, that reminds me what you just shared about the restaurants. I know um, Dr. Heather Lee from NYU Shanghai. She studies uh, in the United States, a uh, 19th century, uh, like why Chinese uh, communities open up restaurants because businesses oh. allow 
they could bypass some of the immigration laws, uh, restrictive immigration laws that could be um, seen with laundromats and similar um, experiences uh, in other parts of the world. And now um, I wanted to share some of the other questions that came in earlier. Um, do you find in your research how traditions and culture changed art and food for the new Latin Asians? Um, well, I don't specialize um, in that, but I have found uh, the impact culturally, especially on food in countries like Peru and I would say Cuba too, was big, right? Um, so uh, the Chinese impacted, um, the way I put it, it's the Chinese restaurant and, Chin and Chinese uh, food allow people from uh, working, working, working class Latin American people to taste other uh, different, very different, uh, to taste different dishes. That's the way that I would say, right? If you have, if you were wealthy, uh, where, where, where we have to imagine very early or late 19th century, early 20th century, right? Plane was not an option. You have to travel, who know how, uh, for taste, different food, so that they bring their dishes, their preparations, their ingredients to the table of working class people working Latin American, working class Latin American people allow to expand uh, the taste, right? Of course, they did not, uh, they did not have always all of the um, items that they need to prepare. So they have to, you know, kind of use what they was at that time at home. So they now they have, for example, in, um, in Lima, they have chifa, which is Chinese rice, basically, right? But with um, some combination, they adapted that. Um, and for example, another another um, um, impact in culture is in the carnivals and uh, in oh my god, in carnivals in Cuba, uh, they the Chinese migrants when they came, they bring like they call like corneta china, which is like an uh, instrument, right? So the people start to uh, introduce and taking this instrument to the festivals and dance and La Conga San Juanera, uh, Santiaguera, sorry, La Conga Santiaguera, which is very traditional from Cuba. Um, yeah, so it, it's a mix. I think if we pay attention to the to the small things, we will we will we will see how this migration have cultural impact on Latin American traditions and way to do things and food and yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, there's so many other questions and we're almost at time. Um, so we have this other question here. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, everyone, but I will just share them with Laura so she can just see later. But um, a question is about your um, research that you shared earlier, um, I think it was a eugenics uh, uh, graphic. And then, so so um, is there a way, or did you find any sort of connection that the idea of eugenics um, derived from the United States that they picked it up? Or was it something they have been thinking about? Um, for what I know and what I've learned, it's like eugenics was a huge thing in Europe at that time. So uh, the magazines and papers traveling to the United States and they were sometimes translated to Spanish, right? So there was like a three stage before arrive to Latin America. But yeah, I mean, like, as I say, the exclusion act of the Chinese exclusion act in 1882 was like promoted this anti-Chinese sentiment, which was basically uh, based on um, eugenics and things like that. So yeah, it was like a uh, three spot conversation between Europe's that it, between theorists that grow up in Europe by pseudo science Europe people and they arrived to the United States and they were translated some in some cases into uh Spanish from uh scholars in Latin America. But yeah, there was like an, a conversation and yeah. Well thank you Laura for answering that last question. Uh, unfortunately there's so many other great ones that we can't get to, but we're gonna hold on to them and really wanna uh, thank Laura for her wonderful presentation and time with us um, sharing 
and her research and it's it's pretty uh pretty exciting and um a, a, a grim as well but also like really relevant and timely and thank you so much please everyone join me in thanking laura again we're going to send out the recording uh, shortly after so you can rewatch it if you need to or share with others and uh with that um thank you everyone for joining today's webinar uh, co-sponsored by kala and reforma we wish you all um great rest of your day uh wherever you are thank you <laughs>